Hey! Thanks for tuning in. Welcome to Nomadic Geek. In the first video of this series, we used the AZ Envy development board equipped with a gas sensor and humidity and temperature sensors to stream its readings and transmit them via WebSockets. In the second video, we set up a Node.js server to stream the sensor values to. In the third video, we constructed the web client page which displayed the values streamed from the sensors to the Node.js server. In the fourth video, we used the ESP32 CAM module to stream video to the Node.js server. In the fifth, we added object detection for our video stream with the help of TensorFlow.js. In this video, we will be replacing the placeholder values with actual humidity and temperature readings obtained from a DHT11 sensor. If you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button and notification bell so you know when I post more content. Stay tuned and let's get started. The DHT11 is a widely used temperature and humidity sensor that comes equipped with a dedicated NTC to measure temperature and an 8-bit microcontroller to output the values of temperature and humidity as serial data. It operates on a voltage range of 3.3 to 5.5 volt and has a current consumption of 0.3 mA during measurement and 60 mA in standby mode. The sensor has a temperature range of 0 to 50 degrees Celsius and a humidity range of 20 to 90 percent with a resolution of 16 bit for both temperature and humidity. Its accuracy is plus or minus 1 degree Celsius and plus or minus 1 percent. The DHT11 sensor is available as a sensor or module, with the latter including a built-in filtering capacitor and pull-up resistor. Let's take a look at some programmers. An FTDI programmer is a device that connects to your computer via USB and is used to program microcontrollers. It converts the USB signals to the appropriate serial signals needed to communicate with the microcontroller. On the other hand, a TTL programmer is a device that is directly connected to the microcontroller and sends the necessary signals to program it. It uses TTL signals to communicate with the microcontroller. Both FTDI and TTL programmers are used to program microcontroller, but FTDI programmer uses USB to communicate with computer and TTL programmer directly connects to the microcontroller. We are going to use an FTDI programmer in this video. The ESP32 CAM MB USB programmer is another way to upload code to the ESP32 CAM board. It attaches to the board and connects to your computer via USB, making it an easy and simple way to program the module. It eliminates the need for other complicated methods and you just have to click on the upload button to program your board. Even though the ESP32 CAM MB programmer is easier to use for uploading code, we will, as I mentioned earlier, instead be using the FTDI programmer as it makes it easier to reach and connect sensors and other devices to the pins of the ESP32 CAM board. By using jumper wires between the programmer and the module, we can easily therefore add more functionality. One problem with the ESP32 CAM that we need to address is that it can be challenging to upload sketches when sensors are already connected at the same time. I have not yet investigated the cause, whether it is due to a voltage drop caused by the sensors connected, or if the amperage may be too low from the programmer to the module, making it only enough for the module itself, or if it is something else entirely. But we can easily just connect the sensors right after the code has been uploaded and right before we reset the module using the reset button. Another problem with the ESP32 CAM module is that if we are using both the camera and the mounted SD card reader, which is common, there are not many GPIO pins left for us to use. As the name suggests, the ESP32 CAM module is powered by an ESP32 chip. Here we can see the particular ESP32 chip on the CAM module. Here we can see it on a development board. This is an ESP32 board by itself. 
The ESP32 has 32 pure programmable general purpose input output pins, GPIO. These pins can be used for a variety of purposes such as digital input, digital output, analog input, PWM output, etc. Upon closer inspection, you may have noticed that the numbers range up to 39, but there are several missing numbers in between. These missing numbers include 20, 24, 28, 29, 30, 31, 37, and 38. Let's compare these to the CAM module and examine the remaining GPIO pins after accounting for those occupied by the camera, SD card reader, etc. We remove the GPIO prefix so that it is easier to see. Let's visit some documentation for the ESP32 CAM board online. For those who wish to delve deeper into the details can do so by following the link provided in the description below. These are the pins the SD card reader occupies. 14 goes to CLK, clock. 15, command pin. 2, 4, 12, 13, data pins. We continue scrolling down to the camera occupied pins. 5, 18, 19, 21, 36, 39, 34, 35, 0, 22, 25, 23, 26, 27, and 32. GPIO 1 and 3 serve as the serial communication pins for transmitting and receiving data, TX and RX respectively. As the ESP32 CAM module lacks a built-in programmer, these pins are utilized to establish communication with the board and facilitate the uploading of code. 33 is used by the built-in red LED. PS RAM takes pin 17. That leaves us with pins 6 through 11 and 16. However, upon examination of the pinouts on the CAM module, it appears that there are no pins marked from 6 to 11. The reason for this is currently unclear. It could be that the camera or another component of the module utilizes these pins for a specific purpose or they simply have not been made available to a pin on the module. Further investigation into this matter will be conducted at a later date. For the time being, we will have to make do with pin 16. Nevertheless, it is important to keep in mind that even if it appears that all the pins are occupied and there is only one left, there is still hope. This is particularly relevant when it comes to utilizing the SD card reader feature of the CAM module. While these pins may be inaccessible for that feature, they can be repurposed for other uses, such as streaming video to a Node.js server. So now we have at least 2, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16 at our disposal. However, 4 is still used for the built-in bright flash LED. We should also be able to use the RX and TX pins 1 and 3 as long as we don't need the serial monitor and the flash boot pin 0 as well. Now that we have a clear understanding of the available pins, the possibilities are endless. From temperature and humidity sensors to motion detection and more, the only limit is your imagination. Let's take a look at what we have so far from the earlier tutorial videos in this series. Open the Arduino IDE and the project from earlier video. After all our necessary includes and definition of the camera, we have our configuration for connecting to the designated Wi-Fi network and the Node.js WebSocket server. It is important to note that the WebSocket server port plays a crucial role in enabling the Node.js server to differentiate between the various connected devices. Therefore, it is essential that each device is assigned a unique port number. These pins are dedicated to the functioning of the camera and are closely aligned with the quality settings configured for the device. In the camera pins header file, we are able to see which specific GPIO pins are utilized by the camera. It is worth noting that a value of minus zero indicates that a particular pin is not in use. 
This feature may have been intended to provide a means of conserving battery life by allowing the camera to be turned off as needed. Back in our code we then initializes the camera and get the particular camera. Here, we have a statement to check if the camera sensor is of the type OV3660. However, as my camera sensor is of a different type, OV2640, this particular portion of the code can be removed if none of your cameras are of that type. We connect to the Wi-Fi and wait for a connection to be established. Here we can also make an optimization to move the connection to the WebSocket server once upon start of the CAM module, rather than connecting in each iteration of the loop. We then retrieve the current frame buffer from the camera. If the frame buffer is empty, it exits the loop and tries again in the next iteration. It then sends the buffer as binary to the node.js server. All this is good so far. But here we are also sending hard-coded humidity and temperature values in place of actual sensor data. This is about to change as we proceed further. First we need to install the DHT library. To do that, click the sketch menu and select include library. Manage libraries. Wait till the manage libraries window opens. In the search bar, type in DHT and press enter. You may have to scroll down a little to the one called DHT Sensor Library for ESPX, or refine your search a little better. I have already installed the library so I can skip this step. Once installed just close the Library Manager. In the beginning of the code we have to include the DHT Library. Define our DHT pin. I choose number 2 as we now know we can use that one. Initialize a float value for both humidity and temperature readings. We initialize the DHT library by creating an instance of it and specifying the pin number that the DHT11 sensor is connected to, as well as informing the library that it is in DHT11 sensor. In the setup function, we initialize the DHT sensor by calling the begin method on the DHT instance. In the loop function, we continuously read and update the humidity and temperature values by utilizing the DHT library's built-in functions. We also make a check if the value really are a number. This is done to prevent sudden changes in the readings due to unreliable data from the sensor. By using the previous value instead, HMEM and TMEM respectively, the readings will remain more stable. We are now utilizing the latest readings of humidity and temperature obtained from the DHT sensor in place of the previously hard-coded values with the same variable names within the concatenated string that is printed out in the serial monitor and sent to the node.js server. This is a diagram illustrating the connections between the components. And this is how it could look like. This is the diagram for the connection between the FTDI programmer and the ESP32 cam. Note that we need a jumper placed between the GPIO0 pin and ground GND when uploading to the ESP32 module. This allows the module to enter programming mode. Once the code has been successfully uploaded, the jumper should be removed and the module should be reset in order for it to reboot and function in its normal runtime. Let's upload the code and see what it does. I'm pushing the reset button to put it in flash mode.
The code is compiled and the uploading starts. The code is uploaded, so I remove the jumper and connect the DHT11 sensor. This is how the wires are connected. If you don't have a jumper sleeve as I do, you can of course use another female to female jumper wire. Let's check the serial monitor. Click the reset button again. The values are not being printed in the serial monitor. This is due to the optimization we did of the code, which waits for a connection to be established with the WebSocket server in the setup function rather than in the program loop function. To test the DHT sensor, we can either comment out the check for connection or start the server. So I'll start the server. There you have it. This concludes this episode of the tutorial series. In the next video, we will take things to the next level by delving into the world of bidirectional communication with the ESP32 CAM module. We will explore how to send commands and control the module's built-in flashlight and connected peripherals such as relays, all from the comfort of the dashboard. Get ready to elevate your project to new heights and control your devices like never before. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the like button so you don't miss out on this exciting journey. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.